Googled, found nutritionist, found James Collier as now our co-founder. Two weeks later, he gave me the formula for Huel, which is pretty much identical to what we got today. Every supermarket's got food which is optimized for taste, and we're optimized for nutrition. The primary purpose of food is nutrition. It isn't taste. You can live without taste. You can live without any texture, but you can't live without nutrition. So it's quite bizarre how everything in the food industry is all focused around taste. I bet you 50 quid you'll love Plio. All right, I'm bending the truth slightly, but they're so sure you'll join me as a customer that they've put the money on it. Their smarter spending platform for business expenses is so good that as soon as you've had a demo, they'll give you £50 on their card just to discover how much of a game changer it is. That's right, your next team lunch on Plio. If you are a leader, secret or not, all you need to do is visit www.plio.io forward slash leaders and book a demo today. And now, before we get started with today's episode, I want to let you know that I'm here in the studio with Jamie Lang, the host of well-established Private Parts Podcast, as well as a recently launched entrepreneurial show called Move. Hello, listeners. Now, Jamie and his business partner, Ed Williams, chat to people like fashion designer Henry Holland, founder of Suitcase Magazine, Serena Gwen, and Michelle Kennedy, the founder of Peanut, the networking app for new mums. Jamie, in one sentence, why should people of secret leaders listen to Move? Okay, uh, probably because we go in depth with entrepreneurs, artists, innovative thinkers and visionaries to bring you two inspirational episodes per interviewee. Right. So once you've made your way through all 48 episodes of Secret Leaders, you know, maybe even earlier than that, head over to your podcast listening platform of choice and download Move. I highly recommend it. Today's guest is Julian Hearn, the founder of the powdered food product Huel. Huel is marketed as a super convenient, nutritionally complete meal replacement and with sales of £14 million last year and a projection for 2019 at more than £40 million, makes Huel one of Britain's fastest growing businesses full stop. Are those numbers still true, Julian? Well, we did 40. That closed at the uh, in Jan. There we go. Already smashing through those targets. This is how current growth looks like. Before Huel, Julian worked in marketing, working with brands including Waitrose and House of Fraser, but tired of the commute, he set up a voucher business from home, famously telling his wife that if he couldn't match his salary in six months, he'd go back and get a real job. And that business eventually sold for more than $10 million. What does she think about that real job? What did she think about my real job? Yeah, the real job that you left and did. <laughs> Was she all right with this decision? I think she, uh, looking back, she's very happy with that decision. Yeah, Yeah. okay. Uh, He said at the time, I had enough money to retire, but you get bored and I needed something to stay busy. So his answer to staying busy was getting back into business. And after a few failed ventures, he eventually founded Huel. It hasn't been all plain sailing, though, with a number of road bumps along the way, which I'm sure we're going to find out about today, I hope. So without further ado, welcome, Julian. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, before we start and get into the real nitty gritty, we've got a little quick fire round. So, office or gym? Gym. City or countryside? Countryside. You're not sure? Mm, well, the countryside can be a little bit dull all the time. So, we do live out in the countryside, but yeah, I think I prefer that. City's too busy. Yeah, okay. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Trapped on a desert island, you can bring three things. Your wife's already there. Phone, charger, solar panel, obviously. <laughs> music device of some description. Ah, you're one of the only people in the world with a phone without a music device. Well, it's not very good sound quality, is it? You want something a little wonder boom or something. A Sonos, a solar-powered Sonos. Yeah, indeed. Got you. Uh, Who's the most inspirational person to you? Oh, my God. Um, Inspirational. We went to Fast Track the other day. Richard Branson uh, came on Skype. He's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, so was he, was he on Necker Island? Was he Skyping in from well, Necker? I don't know because then he stopped halfway through. He said, "I'm oh, sorry about that." There's a football match going on in the background, so I thought, "Well, I'm not sure Necker Island's Necker got Island. a football pitch, but possibly it's got tennis courts. It's got quite a few, hasn't he? Because he does he hosts that tennis tournament. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. So p- possibly, but probably not. Uh, not big football matches, I don't no. think. No. Well, the next question was entrepreneur you look up to. It sounds like he's the man. So what's a different one? It's strange. I don't think I look up to anybody in particular. I think he's sort of there's lots and lots of people that do incredibly well, but. Um, top of my head I don't know Steve Jobs is obviously incredible what he what he achieved and uh, the way he did it as well let's get cracking with the actual interview part we can understand a little bit about what motivates you you've mentioned marketing and brand as like the, the core of what excites you so take us back 
before Huel. So as I understand it, you were commuting from Aylesbury. Correct. Um, which for all of you don't know is just outside of London, an hour outside of London. Um, and did like your whole entrepreneurial journey start just because you didn't want to do that commute? Yeah, basically. Um, me and my wife were trying to have a baby and uh, we'd had a few um, problems, a few miscarriages. So I wanted to be at home uh, with her. So I just realised that uh, doing three hours a day commute plus a you know a full day's work was not that attractive. Aylesbury is not exactly a hotbed of uh, startups or cool companies to work at. So there was no alternative. It is now you're there. <laughs> it is now. But at the time, there was no alternative in terms of a good job and good salary in their local area. So I thought, well, I need a way to work from home. And luckily, I went to an affiliate uh, meetup. And there were some guys there who uh, were earning serious money working from home in their pajamas. And I just thought, if they can do it, why can't I do it? And what was the answer? I uh, spent the next year learning the ropes uh, in the evenings and weekends. So I didn't just jack my job in and just jump straight into it. I took a, a, a while to get confident because I had a mortgage to pay and uh, bills to pay. So I thought well, I need to work this out first before I just jump ship. And so I spent, yeah, evenings and weekends coming from work at seven o'clock at night, have my dinner, then get on the computer, read, learn, practice till 10, 11 o'clock at night, go to bed, get up and do it again. Internet marking for dubbies? Exactly, exactly right. So literally just, I know, luckily I knew some some of it, but the affiliate marketing was a new world for me, really. So I just sort of immersed myself in that, practiced and uh, made a little bit of money on the way in that year. And then got to a stage where I thought, right, I know what I'm doing. I'm making some money, but I need to put more time into it. And that's when I said to my wife, right, I need to just go full time this, jack my job and off I went. What year was this? It would have been 2007, I think. Okay, so 2007, you've set up promotionalcodes.co.uk? Correct. Tell us about that. What was the, you know, as a brand and marketing guy, what was your what was your original <laughs> pitch? How did you think about this? Was it literally just, you know, um, a traffic game or did you try and put like a brand behind it? What no, was your vision for it? There was no brand at all, really. It was literally just like, I need to make some money. What's the best way to make some money? And in the affiliate world, the biggest area at the time was voucher codes. So I thought, well, I'll go after that and uh, spend a long time looking at the other sites of how they were doing it and realized they'd missed, missed uh, um, an area, which was that uh, there's three words that are used on checkouts. Is Pizza, voucher. Express, <laughs> no. free. <laughs> <laughs> it's either voucher codes, discount codes, which was well covered by the other sites, but nobody had gone after promotional codes, which actually appeared on quite a lot of the checkouts. So people search for the word, word they see on the checkout and lots of people hadn't gone after that word. So that's why I registered that very sexy domain name and um, went after those and just started very small, just going one page at a time, whereas most people chucked up a, a site with like every merchant, a stick every merchant, they just hope someone would land. I just started with, say, five merchants and just sent links to those five pages. So a page against another page from a bigger site can win just by links to that one site. But if you've got 2,000 pages, you've got to send a lot of links to it. Did you learn to code uh, yourself or did no, you, you- No code. You, out, did you outsource that or? Correct, yeah. I found a guy that, uh, interestingly enough, I worked with him solid for three years yeah. and um, I never spoke to him uh, on the phone. I never Skyped him, never met him in person. It was all done via email and Basecamp. He was a, a guy based out in Serbia. Oh, wow. And no problems? No problems. He's better, his English was better than me, he's written English. <laughs> Okay. But, you know, you both understood, uh, you know, point and click here. Exactly. Yeah, understood. Okay. So uh, what was the journey wrapping up for, uh, you know, promotional codes? You ended up selling it. How did that happen? Uh, about two years into the uh, the site, I realized that uh, it was an SEO play. SEO uh, is great because it's free if you can get it to work, um, but it can be short lived. You never really know what Google's going to do. So if you base all your business on SEO, it's quite scary. So I started thinking, right, this is worth some money at the moment. If I can sell it now, I've got enough money to retire. And so I actually got onto Google, Googled how to sell a company and uh, looked around, found uh, this guy who's actually now one of our non-execs. And he helped me um, package the business up to sell it. It took about a year in total to get everything together. Uh, you know, he sorted all the legal side out, sorted the accounts out for me, stuff like that. And then he packaged it up, put it out, and uh, we eventually found an American company who wanted to buy it and sold it onto them. Mm. I think a lot of founders find that challenging when they come to a point where they know they want to get out of their business or then they stop selling their own product and they think, how am I going to actually sell my business? And obviously, that's why bankers exist, I guess. But it's it's also psychologically quite difficult because all the way along your business, you've been you've been showing the passion about your business to then go, I actually want out and I want to sell it. Yeah, the lucky thing was I wasn't that passionate about it. I was passionate about making money. That was my objective was to make money. So it wasn't like a real, um, uh, you know, it's not different to Huel. Huel is something I really believe in, yeah. whereas this 
that that site was literally something to make money to solve a problem. So I wanted to work from home, and, and that was the that was the goal. Uh, it wasn't to build a great brand or anything like that. It's literally I need to solve this problem. How do I do it? So when I wanted to sell it, I was quite happy to sell for the right price. So you know, take take a uh, experience into someone who's had a, a career in um, you know your everyday jobs like most of us. And then you've decided to go and do something because you couldn't be bothered to do the commute and you've successfully exited for, was it around $10 million? Yeah. So at that point, is there no sort of, right, I'm going to retire, I'm going to sit on a yacht, because I can't buy a yacht with $10 million, but you can sit on one yeah. if you <laughs> wanted to. I'm sure you can buy some yachts with $10 million. Yeah, 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 possibly. You, but you can definitely sit on a yacht for that much. So, you know, there was no no idea of just, you know, doing this, relaxing, well, we had had a child by that stage, so um, we were spend a lot of time at home. If you've got young children, you probably know exactly what it's like. They're very uh, time consuming, you know, in a positive way. So, you know, you literally, you know, you put everything into those. So me and my wife were at home, uh, you know, I had a young boy and, uh, it, you know, it was very nice. But we did talk about going away. We went on holidays and things like that. We did we spend a little bit of money. We bought a house down on the coast, spent a lot of time down there. So we had, uh, you know, a good lifestyle. But, you know, being at home with a young child all day long can get a little bit, you know, once you've watched children's TV for a few days, let alone a few months, can get a little bit not satisfying. Yep. So I wanted something else to do so that the, the uh, I wanted something three days a week. I wanted to get that work, proper work-life balance. I didn't need to work, but I wanted to do something that was um, fulfilling and kept me a little bit busy. My dad at the time was about 75 years old and he was still working three days a week. And uh, the way he put it to me, he goes, well, if I'm not working, what am I going to do? You know, like he, he, and I think I've got the same sort of mentality that, you know, working full hardcore seven days a week is not, not the right thing to do, but just not working at all didn't feel like the right thing to do. You want to get that balance. Give us an idea here. So the period of time between selling and starting up the next thing, which as I understand, it wasn't actually successful. Yep. What was that time period? And also is it unusual for you, like a second question, so sorry, they're all coming out thick and fast now. Was it unusual for you to have gone from success and I guess the confidence that comes with that, that you know what you're doing, to then starting something, I guess anything new you start, you don't really feel like you understand it. You know, you're going in cold and learning new things, but yep. you hadn't experienced failure yet. Yeah, I mean, the second business I started was something called um, Body Hack, and it was a fitness comparison site. Effectively, I had a thought of genius idea that uh, there's a lot of uh, internet information out there: what to eat, what to do, exercise. But nobody really knows which one's better than the other. So the idea was we put them all into one big site, and they could be directly compared. And uh, the way you do that is you put people through different fitness programs, different meal plans, and then you take all their measurements, you take all the photographs, you could see which ones worked, and the best ones would float to the top, and you'd buy that program. That was the idea of it. So um, spent, I don't know, six months on that. And we launched, got some initial traction. We appeared on the homepage of Hacker News, got loads of traffic. Some people signed up to the program straight away, thought this is going to fly. And it was one of those classic ones. You get the initial PR burst, and then it sort of dies away. And I started thinking, this is going to be hard graph because I was one of the guinea pigs for the first uh, program. We've got five people to put through it, but it's really like time consuming to do. And you've got to get persuade people to follow something rigid for three months, you know, no going out, no drinking, you know, trying to get it. So it was uh, repeat. This is like Rich's ideal lifestyle, basically, <laughs> you're describing, no? This is uh, the polyphasic sleeping, no eating, and just, uh, you know, don't, don't, do you think I don't be why social. Do you, why do you think I got Julian along? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So we're trying to get the you know repeatable results, and so to do that, you have to be very precise. So it's hard graph. The initial traction, I think that if I probably stuck with it, I probably could have made it work. So you could say it was a failure, but what what happened was when I started speaking to people, they said, right, I want those results, but I'm not going to do what you did. It was just too much hard work. You know, to, to, I was I was cooking from scratch and weighing every bit of food that I ate, and it was three main meals and three snacks per day. And the, you know, guys who are at work goes, I can't stop at eleven o'clock and cook an egg and hundred grams of broccoli. I can't stop at lunchtime and cook 200 grams of turkey and uh, 200 grams of baby spinach some quinoa and they just said it's not practical you're you know that is somebody who doesn't work and at the time I wasn't working so it's fine for me so it made me think right okay this could work but even if we put all the effort in I'm still only going to sell a small amount of programs and people are not going to be able to repeat the results because it's too difficult so it made me think there must be a better way to do this protein shakes was what we was using in the afternoon and uh, super convenient super easy to do but you can't live off protein alone. So I thought, well, why can't we just put all the nutrients into a single product? It makes much, it makes life a lot easier, and then people could repeat the results. 
And so that's when I, I Googled, found nutritionist, found James Collier as now our co-founder. And uh, two weeks later, he gave me the formula for Huel, which is pretty much identical to what we got today. But you have, you have iterated on it quite a bit because I think the... <clears throat> version I lost was like V2.3 or something like that. Correct. So what, what have you changed? Because uh, I think a lot of the early feedback was about taste, was it? Or um, Yes. I mean, we have we have changed it. So some of it, most of this is, is tweaks rather than uh, okay. uh, massive changes. So the original formula James gave me was six core ingredients plus a VIP blend. Those six core ingredients, which are oats, flaxseed, pea, rice, coconut and sunflower they're all the same six as it was originally uh, so the VIP blend is pretty similar as well but it's all been tweaks and changes it's like it's not micro adjustments slightly bigger than that but there's been changes taste has changed we've brought out pre-blends it's pretty similar though you know if you look back it's not wildly wildly different so that was the core learning really is that something that's simple and convenient and that's what I think has exploded is that people want healthy convenience food whereas nearly every convenience food you currently eat is pretty low quality yeah. or junk food has got stuff in there that shouldn't really be in there or it's just got the wrong uh, macro and micronutrients it just just doesn't give you what you need and uh, the sort of key thing that we spot really is that every supermarket has got food which is optimized for taste and we're optimized for nutrition the primary purpose of food is nutrition it isn't taste you can live without taste you can live without any texture but you can't live without nutrition so it's quite bizarre how everything in the food industry is all focused around taste This podcast is brought to you by Klaviyo, the growth marketing platform most recommended by other business leaders. And last year, 67 new brands switched to Klaviyo every single day. From a shopper's first impression to each subsequent purchase, Klaviyo understands every interaction, empowering brands to create more personalized marketing moments. When you have a 360-degree view of your customer, the growth possibilities are endless. Clavio truly understands how challenging it is for each and every entrepreneur to get their business off the ground. The cost of acquiring new customers is continuing to rise. Brands are experiencing diminishing returns as well as a small audience reach. Their marketing efforts are continually being squeezed. But... Clavio is helping brands take back control by leveraging their own marketing channels like email, web, and mobile to provide exceptional customer experiences. Clavio continues to help hundreds of thousands of business leaders just like me grow globally. Visit clavio.com forward slash leaders. That's K L A V I Y O dot com slash leaders today to find out more. Now back to the show. And just getting a, a, an insight into the company now. Yeah. So um, take us through the first year. We launched in 2015. I'd probably been working on it for about a year to 18 months. And this sort of key difference for us was that powders have been used in, say, the bodybuilding word, world for decades. We've been giving powdered food to our, our babies for decades as well. But for just the normal sort of Joe public, it was not used. You know, it's a novel type of thing. And that, that was one of our key things. We didn't want to target the bodybuilding industry. They were well um, satisfied with what the products they already had. And um, so we just we wanted to appeal to normal people who worked in an office, really, who didn't have that convenience, healthy food. You know, they had sandwiches or they had crisps and chocolate or their toast or cereal. None of those things are particularly great for you. So it's trying to give them something different. That's why our packaging is quite different from um, what you'd see in a normal bodybuilding world where they do a lot of call outs on their packaging and, and make sort of quite strong claims. We try to minimalize it right down, clean it right down, make it simple um, and more universally acceptable yeah if you haven't seen Huel's packaging for anyone listening it's it's the most clean cut apple apple like yeah. kind of uh, food packaging ever obviously that's been a really core focus of yours is the, is the brand and you've built a really strong brand from that going from your last business where you just said that brand didn't really matter to yeah. this one was that something that was quite daunting and how did you kind of get you know launch the brand was that done in-house was that external coming up with all that the starting point really was I wanted to do something that I was I liked personally. So it was something that uh, this was supposed to be a lifestyle business. This was not supposed to grow into what it's grown into. Yeah, the idea was keep me busy for three days a week. So basically, I made a product for me. So when I started using, you know, when I made the product, I thought, I'm not that unusual, I don't think. So if I just should be able to find a thousand people who are similar to me in the country 
and they pay £45 a month, £45,000 a month, it's half a million pound a year business, something to keep me interested, but it's something that I'm going to do. I'm, going to, I'm not going to sort of compromise on anything. I'm going to make it exactly as I would. So I would wear the clothing, I would use the product, I want it to look the way I would want it so it was made for me really that's what I wanted to do so in terms of the actual uh, logo I came up with a name and then I think I went so on stand for human fuel correct it's yeah I guess yeah human fuel and did you know uh, yeah I knew that but you look really smug I did, I did you look re- smug no, I, did I, was, I was the no, one no, no, I'm actually quite pleased with about that you must be quite pleased a brand works really well when he can kind of guess what it stands for based on the on it. and it's not I mean I know it's pretty obvious but yeah. still <laughs> it, it, <laughs> took take, away, it took away my pride that's for sure <laughs> it takes a very long time to come up with the right name and so I went through quite a few and it and um, what, was the, what was the worst name? Oh well, give, us some of the, give us some Soylent. of the clangers. <laughs> <laughs> Hoyland. Uh, there was a lot. And then I went on Dribble, I think, yeah. uh, to find a designer. And I thought, I don't want to go to a, you know, a London branding agency going to cost an absolute fortune. I'd already burnt some money on Body Hack. So I wanted to do it. You know, I wanted someone who could design. I wanted to look really good. Um, so I found this freelance uh, designer on, on um, Dribble who was based in Turkey, I think. And uh, he did the initial designs, all really clean designs, all really nice, gave him a very simple thing. I just wanted it to be authentic, wanted it to look you know, clean, simple, minimal. And uh, when he came back with it, you know, there was uh, a few iterations, but basically he, he got it right first time. Yep. And he did the original packaging for us as well. And then we did a revision. We went to uh, the, 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 the current packaging. So we did the same revision for that. And uh, that's basically the, the design. So we haven't changed it. You know, I wanted it to stick. You know, I don't, I, I think it's wrong to keep changing and chopping and changing your logos. So basically, it's, it's the same one we've used since day one. And, and then um, obviously, you were saying you, you worked on this pre launch for about 18 months. Was that just refining the product? No? No. It was basically trying to get the bloody thing made. It was absolutely ridiculously difficult. We already had the formula pretty much. Um, three months later, you know, I'd spoken to a lot of people but had no no real manufacturer lined up and then kept going, kept going. People let you down, people don't get back to you, they don't really want to do it, a sort of lack of commitment. Eventually we found this big multinational to make it. Four months later, uh, you know, I was all happy, I thought we was done. So this is nearly a year into it. He, uh, he sent me an email, said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. I nearly gave up at that stage because it'd be so difficult. I thought, well, I've been at this a bloody year. I can't even make a powder that you can make in your kitchen in five minutes. You know, if you get these powders together, you can put them in there. The VIP blend is quite complicated, but to get that done, just put it all in and blend it. It's not, it doesn't seem like it's massively complicated. It's not like making, you know, an iPhone or something that yeah. is complicated. It's just um, pretty basic stuff. But the food industry, you know, even, you know, we're now four years after we've launched, we still have trouble with the food industry. They are slow don't really want to do new things. Um, one of the guys, we must have spoke to about 100, 100 plus manufacturers, um, spoke to one guy eventually said, look, the reason why people don't want to, uh, or not helping you, is because they don't really want to make new stuff because typically they get called all of the time by new startups who want to start it. They've got bright ideas. Typically they go nowhere. So they have to change their line. They have to uh, make this new product. They take a very small order. They put a load of time and effort into it and then quite often there's no reorder. So they don't really want to do it. And that's been the, the, the problem ever since. Uh, they're just, you know, they're factories. They want to make stuff exactly the same every single time. Just keep going, reproducing, reproducing the same stuff. To make something new, they have to order new ingredients. They might have to do new tests. They might have to change their line. They just don't want to do it. That's what slowed the whole thing down is literally just getting things made. Looking forward, or actually, before we look forward, like just day to day, like what is your interaction with the company currently? You've got a new CEO in, well, not new anymore, I suppose. Yep. So what was the process of picking the CEO? Did you have, you mentioned at the start, you know, the things you don't like doing. You know, we uh, heard even last night from David Buttress of Just Eat, you know, discussing the hardest thing as a CEO is sort of realizing uh, your own limitations and being humble enough to accept it at the right time for the best of the company. Did you go through um, like a, a almost tormented phase with yourself or was it just so obvious to you when you wanted to hire a CEO in? It was pretty obvious, yeah. I was struggling. Um, my background is my brand and marketing. So I think the key problem arose when I just realised I wasn't doing any of that anymore. So the stuff that I'm good at, I'm not actually getting to do because I'm too busy doing other stuff that I'm not good at. It just didn't make any sense. So I was really struggling. I was just spread, you spread yourself incredibly thin and uh, you just feel like you're not doing a good job at anything. And the stuff that I was good at, I couldn't hardly get to. I just had to leave for months and months, you know, you just... And so I struggled. Yeah, it's very clear that we needed, I needed some additional help. 
and um, so I went on LinkedIn. I don't use recruiters. I don't like them. I think they're very expensive. So we use, do all our recruitment in-house. And so I went on LinkedIn, searched for um, or looked around for some companies that I sort of thought were pretty good. I just wanted to see somebody with a bit of food experience because we didn't have anybody in-house really that worked in the food industry. And found James, who's now our um, CEO. And I did um, reach out or actually use somebody else to reach out and set up some interviews and he came in and yeah really good guy okay it's 2019 can you give me an idea of um you know 2015 high level numbers 16 17 you know people obviously revenue if you're comfortable doing it or yep. unit, unit yeah, sold sure. like it's really helpful for us to get an idea sure. of that explosive journey because yep. again it's not like you've created a product that's you know um, a slightly different brand to what else was already on there. It's an explosive market disruptor in a real sense, as in it's a product that didn't really exist. Like we say, Soylent was in the US, very different kind of product. Yep. This is creating a whole new category. Yeah, we see it as a new category. We want to call that complete food. So our first year we launched in June 2015. So the first six months, which is we our uh, year end is uh, January. So we did um, £750,000 in the first six months. The second year... In your first year? Yep. Oh, so you year. beat your own targets. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and then we went to well, the first full year, but the second year we did uh, 5.7. Then it was 14.1. Then it was 40. And this year, so Jan 2019 to Jan 2020, we're going to do 60 to 70. Interesting. How how do you um, view, and um, I guess forgive the nosy question, but it's my job. How do you view the difference between the uh, the, the massive shift from, uh, let's say, 15 to 40 and then 40 to 60? Is that really difficult and pressured? Because, you know, obviously there's two sides to this. One is you've got to grow the market. Um, which can only happen at a certain rate. And there's also potentially at the point where Huel's concept is so new and exciting. Um, that is where I imagine that huge growth came from in, I guess, year three. Yeah. as probably the point at which maybe I was at year two or three. I, I think we were both drinking at the same time. I still think he's a trendsetter. I think maybe Rich was having it first because too lazy to cook. But the point being, like, you know, that, that is a, a point of huge mass awareness. Um, and then the market starts to get a little bit saturated and difficult. How do you find that sort of challenge of going from 40 to 60? And do you have, like, in your projections, are you thinking about, you know, the market's obviously slowing because there's just less customers that necessarily fit into that category or... I don't really know the answer. I think I think the num the numbers get bigger and bigger. You know, we're doing we're doing in a month now. We're doing more than what we did in a whole year. So to keep beating your own numbers does get difficult. It is um, easy in the early days, I suppose. You've got the early adopters just come in, people trying the product, and it is a novel product compared to what the the mass majority would use. So it's more um, early adopters and more innovators that are going to use this type of product. So and you, your investors are called hooligans. Hooligans, and so they're, they're, we've got a very strong community. But there, there are to, you know, it's a vegan product, which sometimes doesn't appeal to everybody. So there is there is a certain niche of people that are interested in this type of thing. Julian, I want to talk about something uh, slightly different. What is the cost of a Huel meal in theory? Uh, I think the cheapest way to get it is about one pound thirty one. Without making you sound like you might solve world hunger, is there an angle here of uh, you know the cost of a meal per day? Um, you know, globally in areas where there is extreme poverty, and you've created a product that is a food replacement, and it's a full total nutrition at the moment. You know, it's people like Rich and I that you know are typically having it. You know, you're, you're busy. You you don't want to go without food. It's good to have you know a great level there. Yeah. But you're spending. We're spending one pound twenty two to make sure we're not skipping lunch or whatever. But like ultimately, obviously, there's people around the world that can't afford uh, to have meals per day or whatever. Is there? an angle of, uh, of of philanthropy that you think you could go into with this? Possibly. We've Is been this asked, something you've discussed or considered? Yeah, we, we've been asked about it many times. I think the way we're currently set up doesn't work for that type of thing because we're shipping quite a heavy product. We're making it in one of the most expensive parts of the world, then shipping a heavy product to possibly one of the poorest parts in the world. doesn't currently make sense. You know, we've we've had people contact us before. We said we're happy to you know, tell you our formula, you know, the form is on the back of the pack. We can help you do it. If you want to make it locally in, in a poorer part of the world, that'd be the way to do it rather than ship it from the UK and make it in the UK. You need to buy the ingredients locally and, and make it that way. 
Interesting. It's interesting that other people have also uh, pointed this out, right? Because the cost of the product and uh, the cost of uh, what people actually make in other parts of the world as well. So it's fascinating. Potentially your next business when you uh, get bored sitting on all the yachts that you've already bought, right? One thing we haven't quite fully touched on is actually you've grown incredibly, but has it been all funded from your initial capital that you put in from your exit? Yeah, so I put some money into Body Hack, which is a company before Huel, and then I put a little bit into Huel. So when I say sorry, a little bit, it wasn't really a little bit, probably a couple hundred thousand pounds in total. Yeah. So in Body Hack, I burnt probably about 80, 90, I think, and then so therefore just over yeah. 100 into Huel in total. Put that in from day one, never topped up. So we just used off that. We were profitable for the first uh, three years. That is incredible. Oh, so you're 100% owned by you and your business partner? No, because we took investment last year. Oh, okay. ah. So... Um, October last year, we took investment, put £20 million from Highland Europe, um, valued us at £220 million. Amazing. Amazing. And um, thank you. The reason we took that money is because um, I suppose we didn't need it technically, but. Best time to take money when you don't need it. They correct. Say. Yeah, you can do a much better deal if you do that. You don't want to raise when you need money because they'll you're over a barrel, really. So you don't want to do that. So we made sure that we raised when we didn't actually need the money and we've taken it because you just can't see the future. So it's a massive insurance policy. So if there's any problems, we can buy our way out of them. There's any opportunities, we can buy our way into them. So it's, uh, you know, money in the bank. These series and our live events wouldn't be possible without the awesome continued support of LaFosse Associates, the brilliant recruitment partner of choice for us and most our guests. After all, you can't build a great company without great people, and that's why great people trust LaFosse. Check out www.lafosse.com today. When, when you pitch someone and, and, and you're taking in a 220 million valuation, obviously they're expecting an exit. That's all part of the story. Yep. What is uh, the story of exit that you told? I'm not sure. We did pitch, to be honest. I'm not sure that it was quite that. We did it that way. We did do a deck. Um, but in terms of pitch, it was much more of a, a general conversation. We didn't have to stand up and do formal presentations. The exit... I'm not sure what we said about that, really. I think we just said, look, we, we can see how a path to get to a billion valuation, pounds. And it was pretty straightforward in that respect. I think they just saw the growth. The, the, the good thing is with uh, Highland Europe, we were first into their new fund. So arguably got a 10-year rise on that. They're under no time pressure at all. We're therefore under no time pressure. But, you know, we know they've put some money in, so they're going to want to get some money out at some stage. We've also given share options to everybody in the business quite generous ones so those guys you know we've recruited sometimes on that share option they sort of said look come to, come and join us you're going to get a chunky number at the end um, so there needs to be an end point you know some sort of exit um, whether that's an IPO whether it's a trade sale we haven't decided yet but we see that happening you know in roughly four years time Julian, take, take us through a typical day-to-day -day for you nowadays. What, what, what is it like? Are you doing a three-day week like you always planned? No, I'm not doing a three days a week. All the time, <laughs> what I see, yeah. I'm down to about four days a week now. So it's, uh, it's getting there, not quite there, three days. So I'm CMO, so my, you know, that's my background in marketing, so I spend all my time on, on brand and marketing. But uh, the way I see marketing, where a lot of people use the word marketing and, and advertising interchangeably, I, advertising is one part of marketing. The way I see it is anything that connects with the customer, I should stick my nose into and see how it's going. So the, the beauty of that means is even though I'm not CEO, I can still argue that if, say, our um, operations are not working smoothly enough, say the, the delivery is late, I can say, well, that's affecting the customer. I want that fixed. If the product's late and the manufacturer's not right, then I can say, well, that's affecting the customer. Get it fixed. So I'm still involved. You know, we've got a board meeting on Friday. I'll be going to that. And I'm I'm still heavily involved in everything, keep an eye on everything, but it just means that I can sort of give my opinion without actually having to go down to the minutest detail and follow it all the way through. I can still say this needs to be done in a different way. And then we've got a team now to make it happen. And also it makes sense, right? You are the you are the brand champion, you're the person with a vision that wanted it to happen because you would have it and you feel like other people would have it and that yep. prediction's come true. So in many ways, I often think this like it is a perfectly logical thing for the founder to take a role of chief brand ambassador call it cmo some people call it creative officer there's all those different things yeah. but like realistically it is quite rare that that person's best place in the company is the ceo because they have the 
massive passion of the building part. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when it starts to get big and process driven, you know, this is not really the same kind of lifestyle. You care about the product and customer. Yeah, I've got a very good sense for what our customers want and what is the right thing to do. But I've ne- not necessarily got the skills or the background to actually get it to happen. Sure. So I know what it looks like. I know what it should be, how it should behave. I know it should, what should happen. So then I give my opinion and then other guys make it happen very fair it's been a bit of a roller coaster journey i guess in between leaving a job and being the founder of a 220 million pound valued business what are some of the worst moments i think every every day is pretty bad sometimes but that's the thing that i like about it and this is what i was trying to say to somebody the other day if you don't enjoy problems or grind you're not going to be a good entrepreneur or founder i think that um you know every day but they're they're the days you look back and they're sometimes the best days so when you really you know when i was starting up you you know that when that company let me down that was one of the really bad days i just thought this is done at this point and just thought you know how am i going to get past this you know i've put a year into this and i haven't got anywhere you know you feel pretty soul destroyed at the time but the following day you get out of bed and start all over again and uh, that's sort of part of it. You know, I've seen one of these silly little graph meme things about, you know, one day you feel like a winner, the following day you feel like a failure, winner, fa- failure, that type of thing. And it is that type of sense. And, uh, you know, even even now we're well established, you still think every day it could go to zero. We, you know, we've been let down by a company recently. You know, we've had uh, some other technical problems in the background, you know, every day. And the problems are bigger now. So even though we're well established and you think that uh, things are smoother, the, the problems just multiply and get bigger. So the worst days, yeah, quite often it happens. Every, not so every day feels like the worst day, but they're all pretty pretty tough sometimes. Has there been a moment where you felt like you were going to give up yeah, on this journey? Times. Yeah, loads. What, what do you do in that moment? <clears throat> I mean, are you the type to just sit around and mope and think about it? Do you go looking for support? No, I don't look for support. I typically just think, fuck this, I'll do it. Um, there's... There's times when you just think, how are you going to get past this? But it just, you just have to keep going. I think um, there's people who have done a lot harder things. So you think, well, if they can do it, why can't I do it? It can't be that difficult. And sometimes you think I'm just making a meal of it. So why don't you just crack on with it and get it done? Making a meal of it is obviously the Huel way. <laughs> and uh, what else are you going to do instead? You're going to go and work for somebody else. So you, you just think, I've got to get it done. And there must be a way to do this. You know, this is one of the sort of things, you know, you've got to go... There's no point in going the direct route. Sometimes you have to go around it or go under it or go over it. You know, you have to find a more innovative way to get it done and, uh, you know, just bulldoze your way through sometimes. And I think, um, yeah. Professionally speaking, what has been the hardest day you've had at Hill? I remember back at one Christmas, Christmas Eve, I was putting all, I was doing, in the first sort of six months to a year, I was doing a lot of the evenings, you know, because I had, you know, small team in the daytime that was doing sort of customer service and doing Facebook answers and fa- forum stuff. But in the evening, I didn't expect them to work. We didn't have any cover, so I did them all. I can remember one day, there was all these people on our own forum criticising us for doing something. I just thought, you guys are just being so, you know, we're trying to do the right thing. There's lots of other companies out there you can criticise. You shouldn't really be able to criticise us. We are generally trying to do the right thing. And so when they criticise you, it's quite hard to think, you know, fuck you, what you, you know, so those are those days when people, the internet is full of sort of trolls and people are not the nicest people. So it can be sort of heart, uh, soul destroying, sorry. So those sorts of days, that is the day when you think, what am I doing this for? Why should I do this if I'm going to get a load of criticism? But you just have to push through. Okay. What do you think going to do after Huel? Uh, somebody asked me this other day. I've got no idea. Listen, fuck that guy. <laughs> We're asking it fresh. I know you don't tell him, but uh, you've got to tell us. What, what do you? There must must have there must be some things you look around in the world and be like, that is mind blowing. But I would do it slightly differently, and this is maybe how. No, honestly, at the moment I'm just 100 percent in Huel. So I just head down. He's like, uh, you know, you said I've been doing a lot of podcasts lately. Yeah, but I suppose I've done five or six in total. And, uh, you know, typically I don't come to um, networking events. I don't, go, I don't go to speaking events. I try to keep it to the bare minimum. The reason I like podcasts is that, I said earlier, they're scalable. So, you know, I can do one, I can give loads of answers, hopefully, in one of these sort of podcasts. And then anybody, I get, you know, emailed or LinkedIn all the time asking me to give advice. Can you spend 20 minutes for coffee? Can you go, can you give me 15 minutes on the phone? No, not really. Go listen to this podcast. I, I give a lot of information in that. So I, I like doing these, but typically I, I'm just 
or somebody asked me to speak at a um, conference the other day about uh, new foods. So I goes, I've got no idea about anybody else's. I don't know what anybody else is doing in the industry. I'm just doing my own thing. Okay. How about this? The perfect way to end. What are some of the most common questions you get asked on LinkedIn? And answer them here on the podcast. Okay. So typically people will say, um, how did you pick your category? And I suppose, you know, how did you pick the product you wanted to launch? Okay, Julian, how did you pick the product you wanted to launch? <laughs> well, it was a product that I realized I and my friends needed. So that's how I did it. They said, how do you create a great brand? So uh, I think a great brand, I think you have to start with a good name, good logo. So the visual identity is one part of the brand. But for me, it's every single thing that the customer experiences. So it's the delivery box, it's the pouch, it's the way the pouch opens, it's the email they receive, it's the fact that we put a thank you card in, it's our customer service when they answer, it's the right type of people. So we, you know, it's every single little thing, it's the, it's the attention to detail that makes a great brand, I think. What advice mm. have you been given on your journey that has been life-changing for you? This is going to sound a little bit weird, but this was pre-entrepreneurial journey. This was outside. This was this was actually a long, long time ago. I was I, when I was at university, I had to work on a building site, and um, I was struggling. We were we were putting houses together, like timber frame houses, and it was getting late in the day, and there was this, there was this big timber frame uh, panel came in, and it wouldn't fit. So you know, you like. Right, where are we going to get? We've got to get this done, and uh, and then one of the guys come over. He goes, and I was like struggling for ages to get this done. I couldn't get it fitted, and in the end, he said, "Look, if it don't fit, just force it." She so just oh. came over with a massive sledgehammer, just whacked it, put it in place, off we go, gone on. So ever since then, I've always remembered that. And I think when you get to a certain problem, you sort of sometimes can think, "What's the logical way to get around here? How do you do it?" Sometimes you just brute force. You just got to push straight through. And um, that's quite often get things done, sometimes very simply, just by sort of like, I don't know, calling for a new frame to be fitted or cutting it down or making a new order. Just hit it with a sledgehammer and get it in. And surprisingly, this is usually, we usually get a different answer by asking this. It sounds like it might be the same. But what advice would you give to entrepreneurs starting up? And I guess especially ones in the, the food and drink category. Uh, there's lots of advice. I've read a little bit on my... Um, Instagram the other day, there was somebody asked me, how do you become a millionaire? And so sort of the same sort of advice would, would, would follow. The first thing you do, you've got to bloody start. A lot of people don't start. If you don't start, you're never going to get there. Having some sort of, it depends on what your objective is. Though. So my, have some sort of clear, clear objective of what you're trying to do. So my first business was make money. Huel was to be proud of doing something. So slightly different ways you'd approach stuff. I think um, for Huel, being mission-based is very good. It gives you that sort of North Star you're going after and you know what you're doing. And I think having that big mission is on nearly every wall of, in our office helps recruitment, helps uh, attract customers as well and gives you that sort of, you can't deviate and go into new areas. And um, But I think sometimes you're just going at it harder than you think you need to. So put more effort in. You need to become obsessed in the first 18 months, two years, you need to be 100% in, you know, you say no to all events, you say no to going to agencies, you come and see me, you know, you, you you know, try and get totally into it, then you will see every single problem, be your own customer, um, your own user, you know, use the product day in, day out, and then you'll experience what the problems are with it, you know what needs to be fixed. Direct to consumer, I think, was really beneficial for us, so you get close to your customers as best as you can, so people say, you know, go out of the building and meet your customers. We didn't need to. We was online. They're always coming to us. So I did customer service for a long time. I did all the Facebook answers in the evening for probably 18 months. Um, forum, you know, you just get really close to your customers. I think they're super, super powerful because you can see the problems and you can iterate a lot faster, a lot faster. You see that problem, fix it, fix it. Another problem, fix it, fix it. Instead of like a short, snappy answer, we literally got a Bible of how to build a brilliant brand. So thank you very much for that. Julian, it's been a pleasure to get you on Secret Leaders. Thanks for thank coming in. Thank you very in. much. Thank you very much for having me. How do some of the world's sharpest minds start their day? By putting their brain first. And it's not just our secret leaders who kick off every day with heights. From Stephen Fry to best-selling author and fellow podcaster Dr. Rongan Chatterjee, who give us rave reviews. So if you care about your brain's health and cognitive potential, think heights. Listeners can get 25% off their first month with the code LEADERSHEIGHTS at www.yourheights.com. Next week on Secret Leaders. 
The ultimate vision is to be able to sate your curiosity about anything in the physical world at the moment at which you're looking at it. The secret of our success was that we knew nothing about music. Whenever we heard songs, we'd be like, what is that? And that's how we came up with the idea for Shazam. I blame my business partner. He would hear the most popular songs and go, I have no clue. I'd love to find out. What if I could use my mobile phone to identify music? That was Jess Butcher from Blipper and Diraj Mukherjee of Shazam, the founders of two of the most visionary companies ever produced in the UK. One that went well and one that sadly didn't. This was actually our first ever live recording of Secret Leaders. And at the time, Blipper, a pioneer in augmented reality, was still going and valued at over $1 billion. And Shazam was in the running to be sold to Apple. It's a really pertinent and valuable reminder to all entrepreneurs that no matter your perceived success at the time, the journey is long and full of surprises. At the time, Jess had left Blipper already, so the fate of the company was out of her hands. She's since started a new brilliant company reimagining social media called Tick, which you can check out at tick.done. Diraj exited Shazam to the world's biggest company, Apple, for £400 million, and now spends a lot of his time advising and investing in startups. And next week's episode focuses on how you can come up with such visionary concepts and take them to market for growth. It's innovation at its finest, only on Secret Leaders. So tune in or you'll miss out. We hope you enjoyed this episode. It was brought to you by me, Dan murray Serta, producer Rich Martell, editor Harry Morton of Lower Street Media, and marketing by Hannah Russell of Mags Creative, and stunning visual design by our talented designer, Christina Naru of SmartUpVisuals.com. You can check out show notes, transcripts, and our upcoming live events on our website, SecretLeaders.com. If you've not yet, please hit subscribe, leave us a review, tell a friend, take a screenshot of this episode and add it to an Insta story. I mean, you know what to do. And tag us at Secret Leaders or at Dan Murray Serta, and we'll add you to our story in appreciation back. Rich and I put together Secret Leaders for free because we love our day jobs as entrepreneurs, but every time someone takes the time to share it, it means a lot to us. So don't forget, it's the little things like that that keep us coming back every week and every year into the studio. See you next week. See you next week. See you next week. See you next week. See you next week.